Um, so hi, my name is Mary. I'm one of the leaders here at St. Augustine's. And hi to everybody who is watching or listening online. So how's everyone's summer been? Um, I call it summer very loosely. The sunshine has been lacking. The kids have been cooped up. Holidays have been cut short because of bad weather. And I know for some of you to hear today um, that the flooding's caused significant damage to your homes. And with the forecast the next two days, it's not looking great either. Maybe you're already looking to wave goodbye to the last couple of years of COVID and all the destruction that that left in its path. And we're looking forward to the year ahead, but are finding it hard to be hopeful amidst all that's happened. And that is understandable. And so today through this psalm, I hope to restore some hope, some assurance that no matter where you're currently at, God has got your back and is with you in it all. And why hope today? Because when I read through Psalm 147, the enduring feeling that I was left with and the thing that I felt that God wanted to impart to you today is that we can put our hope and our trust in God. But part of the problem is, how do we maintain hope in seasons where it does seem like God is distant or far away? How do we foster our faith to maintain a hopeful orientation in our lives? Because it's so much easier said than done. But we have to hope that God can deliver. But to be able to do that, we need to have faith. And so I want to start by tackling the faith bit. To have faith, we have to believe. We have to want to want God. I remember my dad um, talking about the fact that as we grew into adulthood while still living at home, he wasn't going to constantly ask us where we were, what we'd been doing or who we'd been with. Because he was going to parent us as God parents us. Dad wasn't going to force himself on our thinking. Our decision-making was our own. Our actions were our choices, but he would always love us. He'd always be willing to help us when we needed him. He'd always give advice if we asked for it. And God does the same. He shows up where he's wanted. He shows up when we ask him to. He talks to us when we engage with him, when we seek him, when we try and find him out. But if we're not interested in what he's got to say, he'll back off and he'll let us do our own thing. And you can think, well, why does God need us to love Him? He's God. I've got four kids and I love them with all my heart, but I also want them to love me back. They're part of me. I want to be in relationship with them and for the love to be a two-way thing. And I'd be gutted if it wasn't reciprocated. God created us. He created you. And He wants you to be as much in love with Him as He is with you. He delights in you and He delights in the love that you show for Him. But I know many of you here will be sitting thinking, that many of you will be sitting here who are not hopeful, thinking that you are struggling with doubt. Maybe you're going through a dry spot. God comes where He's wanted, but I don't even know if I want Him. Or maybe it's, I want Him, but He never shows up and I'm mad at Him. So how do we come to want God? It's easy to think I would probably be more enthusiastic and passionate about God if my life got better. But is that true? You may be grateful, you may enjoy your life more, but you probably won't be as enthusiastic or as passionate. The theologian G.K. Chesterton said this about Jesus and his disciples. Jesus promised the disciples three things, that they would be completely fearless, absurdly happy and in constant trouble. Often we, see, we try and see a life without all the trouble, thinking that that will bring us closer to God. But the surprising things about the times of feeling the absence of God and the distance between our desired circumstances is that if we posture ourselves right, then it can be a time in which our hunger and our desire for God grows immensely. The preacher and author John Tyson says, the gap is the gift. The distance between what you want and where you are is the thing that creates the hunger. And I found that in my life, the past few years have actually not been too bad. There have been times um, that they've, but it's been a struggle trying to find that focus in God, to have that discipline to really seek Him out. Yet in those times in my life in the past where I felt desperate, there have been times, they have been the times that have created that intimacy, that yearning and that hunger for God. Now, I think God is a God of love. He's my heavenly Father and I believe that He despaired at the decisions that I made that got me to those places of desperation. But He allowed it to happen. He allowed me to make my own decisions just as my dad did. 
God doesn't wrap us up in cotton wool. But through that hunger and that desperation, my passion and my need for God in my life increased. And I got to know and grow closer to God in a way that I hadn't before. When we have a great day, we thank God for the day and we head off to sleep. But when we've had a bad day or we're really struggling in life, we're probably either doing one of two things. We're either ignoring God altogether or we're crying out for Him to intervene. And God would much rather you choose the crying out option than the ignoring one. He is not a fan of spiritual apathy. He loves engagement of any sort. And so we have to get out of that thinking that if we had a better life, our hunger would increase because so often the opposite happens. God will allow us to be in those situations to stir our hunger up. And this is an uncomfortable truth that at the times of suffering or of feeling abandoned by God, they're often the catalyst for the deep and meaningful growth in our life of faith. Because God wants us to hunger for Him. And when you go back to the passages of the Bible of passion, the majority of them are framed out of hardship. That's not saying you should seek out hardship, but it's saying that we should stop to try and stop trying to fix things ourselves and not distance ourselves from God in those times. But instead, we should invite God into our difficulties. We should cry out to Him. Hunger is born from frustration, dissatisfaction, and anger. But often, us Christians are too nice. And we can be a bit too repressed in our feelings and our emotions. But sometimes you have to let it all out. You can still trust God and be angry and upset with Him. Jesus was heard for His loud cries and tears. When Jesus wasn't happy in the temple, He got angry. We are allowed to show emotion. I know it's not very Kiwi, but it's okay because Jesus did. Sometimes we all just need a good cry and a good shout at God. And God doesn't want to disappoint you. He loves you. We are human. There are so many things that we want and crave. But if we attach it to the wrong thing or the wrong person, we are going to get burnt. If we turn that passion and desire instead towards God, He won't let us down. He won't disappoint and He will satisfy us. David says in Psalm 63, Because your love is better than life, my lips will glorify you. This is David who's in the wilderness, who's lost everything that matters to him, but he's still praising God. But David found something that was better than life. And in his life, he had lots of wives. So I'm sure he was having a good old time in that area. But he said God's love was better than life. He was a powerful man, but he said God's love was better than life. He was famous. He was well known. But he said God's loving kindness was better than life. Throughout all of those things, God's love meant more. The promise and the hope of Scripture is that the more you know God, the better He gets. The more you lean into His unfailing love, He doesn't disappoint. The more you understand His mercy, grace, kindness and love, the more you go deeper in relationship with Him. And the more the God way of doing things seems a better idea than our own. The key of stirring up more passion for God is not doing more for God, but learning to delight in God's love. And this is what the psalmist is doing in our psalm in verse 1. Hallelujah, it is a good thing to sing praise to you, God. Praise is beautiful, praise is fitting. But singing hallelujah, again, can be hard when things aren't so summery. For our family, aside from the terrible weather that we've all experienced, this summer hasn't been easy. Two weeks ago, very sadly, my father-in-law, Alistair, passed away after a short and painful 12-week battle with pancreatic cancer. Last week, we celebrated his life at his memorial service. And with these celebrations, you get a true sense of who the person really was. And the two main things that stood out about Alistair were that he, one, loved his family, but above all else, he loved God. For me, the things that have kept my faith going are the undeniable and supernatural experiences I've talked about before that have taken place in my life. But for Alistair, it was the Bible, the Word of God that fueled his faith. He read it morning and night, and he had that hunger for intimacy with God. Alistair believed till the very end that God could heal him. He had a deep hope that it would happen. In his last week, he held on longer than the health professionals thought he would. And we all believe that it was because he was giving God as long as possible to heal him. 
I should say that he wasn't naive about this. He had heard the doctor's prognosis and had organised plans for his funeral accordingly. But he had a strong conviction and no doubt that if it were God's will, God could heal him on this earth, even though everything outwardly suggested otherwise. And that was so challenging and so humbling to me. Throughout his illness, not once did Alistair complain. Throughout it all, he repeatedly said, God is good. Giving glory to God at his time of huge suffering was more important to him than even himself and all that he was going through. One of his highlights was having his non-Christian carers read him the Bible as he lay in bed. He was so excited to tell us. He was always wanting to share God's love with others. And I say all this coming from a man who never showed once an ounce of piety, who lived his life with integrity and humility. His faith was strong and genuine and it stayed strong and gracious till the very end. Alistair and I were very different people. We had at times very different views on theology. Yet in those last 12 weeks, he indirectly taught and challenged me more about my faith and hope in God through all the seasons than anyone has in a long time. But although, of course, now he's healed in heaven, God didn't heal Alistair while he was still living on this earth. He didn't answer his or our humanly cries for healing. And we don't understand why not. And there are so many of these questions that we all often grapple with. But in the past 12 weeks of his illness, the love of God flowed and there was a hope throughout it all. There were words of loves that were spoken that had previously been unsaid. My personal relationship with him grew stronger in those last three weeks. Brendan and I have been overwhelmed by the love support of prayers of all our friends. So many of you here have blessed us incredibly during this time. And at his memorial service, there was such a tangible sense of the Holy Spirit. People who didn't know God said that they experienced something that they hadn't before. In verse 3, it says, He heals the brokenhearted and bandages their wounds. And the past 12 weeks have been such a testament to that verse. And what hope and assurance of God's love was given to us in those 12 weeks. Our prayers weren't answered in the way that we had hoped. Yet the fruit of Alistair's faith and his trust in God outpoured and gave hope to so many during this difficult time. And we've been able to sing those hallelujahs in spite of it all. In verses 6 to 18, we read, He spreads snow like a wild white fleece. He scatters frost like ashes. He broadcasts hail like birdseed. Who can survive this winter? Then He gives the command and it all melts. He breathes on winter and suddenly it is spring. I was born in Halifax in the north of England. If anyone's been watching Happy Valley, it's filmed up that way, where it gets very cold and snowy. And there was a patch of grass not far from our house on the way to church where crocuses would bloom. This old photo was taken in the March that I was born. There would still be snow on the ground, but through the snow, a small flower bud would be poking through, the first sign of spring in amongst the obvious winter. And what a joy it is when we see that new life, to see the beauty of God's creation pushing through the bleakness of winter. And there's so much to be hopeful for in spring. Just by looking at the nature around us, lambs being born, flowers emerging, the sun's heat feeling warmer, the day's getting longer. But we must remember that God is wanting to work in our lives in the winter seasons as well. As minister and theologian Samuel Rutherford famously said, grace grows best in winter. We look forward to spring where we see new signs of life and joy, but God does something significant in our lives in winter as well. And now I wanna invite Peter Cox to come up on stage and I'm gonna talk to Peter a bit about his season of winter that turned into spring. Let's give Peter a round of applause. So Peter, um, the story starts back about 10 years ago when you were suddenly um, lost your job and you spent six months job searching. Um, but you said that, that you felt that that original job was a job for a season. Can you tell us a bit more about that? Yeah, what, <coughs> excuse me. Uh, what, in that job, I knew that it wasn't a job that would be um, forever and ever. Uh, and I knew there'd be an end point. And by the time I'd got to that end point, I'd be an old man and who would want to employ me? So I always had that sense that God... What is going to happen at the end of this time? What, 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 will, you know, what can I do? What, what will happen? And I had two distinct, uh, two specific times when I really felt that he spoke to me and said, 
uh, I will provide. Okay. <laughs> So, um, how many jobs did you apply for during that six months, Peter? Uh, about 120. Did you, get an, did you get an interview for any of them? Nope. Nope. <laughs> but you still trusted God in that time? I did. Uh, we stood on, on that promise, on those promises. And um, yes, there were ups and downs, but uh, we stood on that time. Yeah. And um, you wondered how long God would, you'd have to wait, but then something came up. That's right, and and uh, it was a it was a gradual thing, and um, we had an inkling that something was going to happen halfway through that six month period, but it then took another three months before uh, it came to fruition, and we actually got started in the new business. So the new business was travel <laughs> and golf golf tours in golf the travel tours. industry, taking people around the world playing golf. So you yeah. bought this business; it was seemingly going well. Things were looking up. You're about to hit your fifth year, and it's about to be making the best year yet. And then... COVID. <laughs> COVID happened. And so how did COVID affect you? <laughs> uh, life uh, stopped, basically. Um, as Mary said, we were about to have our, our best year ever. Um, everything was going really well. Uh, and uh, yeah, life, life came to a grinding halt. We had to refund lots and lots of money. We had no money coming in, and uh, yeah, life life um, was different, should we say. And what I want to say about Peter this time, some people think jobs are beneath them. Do you want to talk about some of the jobs that you were doing during this time, <laughs> when you were able to work again? Yeah, yeah I mean, um, uh, I, I, I Ubered, uh, I uh, served drinks at Spark Arena when the Lion King was on, um, we assembled light switches uh, for some friends who very kindly offered uh, jobs to, a, a job to do. Uh, both Marion and I did that for, for quite a few months. Uh, so, yeah, yeah. And you got to the point where you actually had to sell your family home that you'd had for years. Yep, yeah. Well, there's a few things that happened during that time. Um, firstly, Marion ruptured a disc, which um, we thought, goodness me, what else can happen? Um, a little few, a few months after that, uh, the bank rang up and said they wouldn't, refu uh, they wouldn't re um, renew our mortgage facilities, which meant that we had to sell our family home. Um, and then uh, we were selling our home and uh, uh, moving. Uh, we'd moved half, uh, halfway into a, um, a rented accommodation uh, whilst we did some work on the new place. And Marion fell over and broke her arm and dislocated her shoulder uh, in the middle of the move. So that was pretty good. Um, that, that's, and we're still um, recovering from that to a degree. So it wasn't plain sailing, shall we say. <laughs> but throughout this, what, there were some things that God, you felt God spoke to you during this time. Yeah, all, all through, um, we had an assurance. I mean, uh, we very much believe that the business that we had um, was God-given. Uh, we very much believe that uh, uh, we were doing doing uh, that that he wanted us to do, um, and so we thought if he's given us that, he's not going to take it away. He's not going to leave us uh, in in um, uh, abandoned, so to speak. So we knew that we should hang on in there, uh, and um, a couple of things that um, kind of we we held on to during that time. I mean, there was uh, one particular song that. Um, which we'll be singing after communion, coincidentally. And that was coincidentally. I didn't know about that. But, um, you know, I love you, Lord, for your mercy never fails me. All the days you've be I've been held in your hands. From the moment I wake up until I lay my head, I will sing of the goodness of God. And, and that's what we've, we've tried to do. And there's been ups and downs. And one of the things that has uh, actually helped on the downs is that always at that, some, at that point, someone has come along and we've had a great support in all sorts of ways from various uh, ones of you uh, here in the church. So thank you very much for that because it does make a, a big difference. So, yeah. And now you're in a place where you're busier than ever. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, um, and I think the, the, the real story we're taking out of that is that um, God does restore the lost years. And um, there's a real sense of blessing in that. Uh, and that he does not leave us. Um, recently uh, was reading Job and, you know, how uh, the Lord uh, restores him um, uh, at the end of all his sufferings. And I'm not comparing myself to Job or anything <laughs> like that, but I'm just saying that the Lord, he restores those lost years and, and we're thanking him for that. Thank you, Peter. Let's give him a round of applause.
Now, I consider Peter to be a good friend of mine. And I can honestly say that through all of this season, I didn't hear him complain. I was amazed at his lack of self-pity, which if he'd shown, I feel would have been completely justified. Peter and Marion, of course, during this time were an absolute inspiration to me in their faith. In a way that they chose to draw closer to God and not to turn away where it would have been so easy to do so. They were in the winter, but they kept hopeful for the spring. When Peter lost his job 10 years ago, this wasn't the journey that him and Marion were expecting, but it's the one that they have travelled. But I know that Peter and Marion aren't the only ones here who are going through winter, have been going through winter over these past years. I've journeyed with many of you. Some of you are still in that winter. And I'm amazed and in awe of the faith and trust that so many of you have put in God through these bleak seasons. And I commend you for that. And I'm also grateful for your faith and hope because it has inspired not only me, but in many more, of many more people around you. But for some of you, maybe it feels like winter now has really taken a hold and you're struggling to trust God, to believe that He has a plan for you. And I want to say that that's okay to feel that too. In the Psalms especially, we are given permission to wrestle and be angry with God. But we are also encouraged to be open to the possibility that God can and will do something in our lives during these seasons. And remember, we are not meant to do this Christian life alone. Jesus didn't do it alone. We have each other and that is why we gather together as a whānau at church on a Sunday. And at times when our faith is weak and we don't even feel we can pray, we have others around us who we can pray for us or even just pray on our behalf when we don't have the strength to do so ourselves. We need to learn from each other. If we want to get better at doing something, we immerse ourselves in it. We read about it. We practice it. We spend more time with those people who can teach us. And the more of that then rubs off onto us. Peter and Joseph lost Jesus as a kid during the Passover because he was spending his time in the synagogue with the teachers, wanting to learn and ask more questions about his heavenly Father. And so if we want to get more passionate about God, if we want to go deeper with God, a good thing to do would be to seek out those who are one step ahead in their faith. Because it's not easy. The journey that we've taken when we say yes to God, it can be a hard path. But we can be sure that God is always with us when we search for Him. Psalm 23, even though I walk through the darkest valley, I will fear no evil for you are with me. God is with us. He sent His Son Jesus to die for us on a cross crucified, a brutal way to die. He didn't want to suffer like that. He didn't want to feel that pain, but He died for each and every one of us. He died for you. And God's Holy Spirit was given to us so that we can have an intimacy with God that even the psalmists weren't able to. Jesus dying for us gives us that hope we need to know that God is always with us and that He will show up when we put our trust in Him. But we have to say yes to Him. We have to invite Him into our pain and our suffering, into our decision making. God shows up where He's wanted. Do you want Him in your life today? A couple of weeks ago, Phil and Angelica had a situation, they probably saw them when you came in, that they wanted God to speak into. And so before church, they asked God to reveal some answers to them. After church, they talked and it turned out that each of them individually and via different people, had, God had answered their question. They came to church expectant to hear from God and they did. How many of us come to church expectant to hear God's voice? Or do we just attend because of habit or to see friends and don't even allow God in? For many understandable reasons. Kids are distracting us. Life's just too busy. It's too confronting or it's too painful. Maybe we felt let down by God so many times that we feel He's out of chances. And I get that. And I want to acknowledge that if you're feeling like you're in that place today, that is not easy. And well done for even showing up and coming along. Thank you for doing that. But I also want to assure you that God's way is the best way and it's the only way. And we can trust God because He tells us over and over and over again in the Bible that He's got our back. Romans 8, 28. And we know that in all things, God works for the good of those who love Him. Psalm 37. Trust in the Lord and do good. Dwell in the land and enjoy safe pasture. Take delight in the Lord and He will give you the desires of your heart. Commit your way to the Lord. Trust in Him and He will do this. Matthew 6, 33. But seek first His kingdom and His righteousness and all these things will be given to you as well. God wants us to seek Him out. He wants us to delight in Him, to be passionate about Him, to hunger for Him. Are you expectant for God to work in your life today? Are you up for really giving God a chance? Even if it's just a tiny one. 
because he'll take that. But remember, this isn't about God ticking, getting God to tick the boxes of our wants and our needs. This is about moving into a place where we can really trust and put our hope in God with all of the plans that He has in store for our lives, even if it's maybe not what we had in store for ourselves. Are you willing to put your hope and trust in God in all the seasons of your life? Because God is here now and He wants you to trust Him with it all. Because He loves you so very, very much. And He would love for you to say yes to Him today. Let's stand and pray. Father God, I just thank You that You love us. No matter who we are, no matter what we do, no matter how large or how small our faith is. If we've said yes to you, you are there for us. And Lord, you know where everyone is at today. And I just pray that during this worship, you will open our hearts to hear what you have to say, to be expectant to your presence and your word in our lives. Lord, you are here. You left your spirit with us. You are a God of truth, of hope, and we can trust you. And we just ask that you would come right now. Thank you, Lord.